Okay, let's be real. It's 2016. Whenever you need to get data from an external website, they should have an API and make your life easy. But in the real world, that is not always the case. There are numerous reasons why you might want to get data from a web page or multiple web pages, and there is no API in sight. And when that is the case, you are going to need to fall back onto web scraping and browser automation. Now, web scraping has some very legitimate use cases. It's used all the time for automated testing, making sure that every pathway through your app works properly, or getting data from old school websites for completely sincere reasons. You might have an old accounting system at a small company and you would need to pay someone thousands of dollars to manually aggregate data from their website when you could just automate it for free or putting together data from SEC filings, which are public information, and you just don't want to pay for the Bloomberg terminal, etc. But you can also use web scraping in some slightly shadier ways, like quickly testing website vulnerabilities to know which attack vector to pursue, or injecting malicious JavaScript into multiple pages, or constantly overloading specific API calls to intentionally try and take a site down. Like any powerful technology, it can be good or bad depending on how you use it. But any way you slice it, web scraping is an essential tool for your web developer toolkit. And I am going to teach you how to become an expert on it on an Always Be Coding screencast. Now, web scraping is language agnostic. Any good programming language will have tooling included for web scraping, but I find it easier to stick to scripting languages. I'm talking about Ruby, Python, or JavaScript. I'm going to be using Ruby here because in my opinion, it's the best one, but you can really use any language that you want. Also, I'm going to do my scraping in the context of a Rails app. You do not need to use Rails for this. Most of the time you're just getting data, you don't need a web framework. I'm just using Rails because it does a bunch of configuration for me that I don't want to bother setting up on my own, but again, feel free to use anything you want. So I'm going to make a new Rails app, Rails New Skyscraper, and then CD into it, and then open it in Atom, and clear. Kill four birds with one stone. Now I'm going to need to add two gems to the gem file. I'm going to add pry rails, which is a gem for making your console output look a little bit nicer. And then I'm going to add the gem water, W-A-T-I-R, which is the Ruby library for doing browser automation. And then I'm going to bundle. Um, one other thing that I'm going to need to do. When you're web scraping, you can use any browser that you want. I prefer to use Chrome since I like its developer tooling the most. But the Chrome web driver probably doesn't come installed on your machine by default. That's okay, it's really simple to set up. All that you need to do is go to this site right here and install the proper driver. I'm on a Mac, so I would download the Mac web driver, open it up, and you'll see that it comes with this executable file. And then all you need to do is move that executable file somewhere onto your path. So I could, for example, do move desktop slash Chrome driver and move that to anywhere on my path. User local bin would be a good place for that. I already have it installed, but if you just ran that, um, that'll install the Chrome web driver onto your machine. Okay. So now let's go ahead and open up Rails console. Now we're in our Rails console and I'm gonna do browser equals water colon colon browser dot new. And then this takes one argument, which is the browser you wanna open. I wanna open Chrome. And you'll see that it actually opens a browser. Now I call this a ghost browser. It's an actual running implementation of a Chrome web browser, only we have a reference to it here in our Rails console, and we can script it from our console. For example, I can do browser.goto google.com, and you'll see that the browser on the right-hand side actually goes to google.com. I could tell it browser.goto, let's say, Hacker News. And there it goes, it goes to Hacker News. 
And at any time, I could go ahead and do browser.html. And that will give me the HTML of the current page that the browser is on. I can actually then open this with my mouse and let's go ahead and you know click on something and it goes to a site. I could do browser.url and that will give me the URL of the current site it's on. I can tell it browser.back to make it go back. I can also on this browser open the Chrome DevTools and use this to inspect the page which is going to come in handy when we want to write scripts to scrape data from it. And then if I want to close it, I do browser.close and there it goes. The other thing that we're going to need is an XML parser. When we did that browser.html and got this data structure back, well, this data structure is a string representation of HTML. And HTML is a subset of XML. And we can parse XML directly into a Ruby object. The way we do that is with a library called Nokogiri. You should have Nokogiri installed because it comes default in later versions of Rails. But if for some reason you don't have this, just add the gem Nokogiri to your gem file and that's all that you need to do. Now the way that we can take XML and turn it into Ruby is by doing Nokogiri colon colon HTML dot parse and then giving it the browser dot HTML. I'm going to save this as a variable called doc. And as you can see, it parsed that XML into a Ruby object. Now, if we look, the Ruby object is of class type Nokogiri HTML document. Now, this gives us a couple superpowers when we try to query it. First and foremost, Nokogiri document is made up of Nokogiri elements. Each XML tag from the page becomes a Nokogiri element. Each element has children, which can either be other Nokogiri elements or text nodes. This is exactly the same as the HTML DOM, by the way. We can also query this Nokogiri document with CSS selectors. So if I do doc.css and then pass in a CSS selector, I'll just do A for now, this will return an array of all matching items to that CSS selector. So in this case, it'll be all the links on this page. And if we do dot count, we'll see there's 227 links on this page. The other function that you're going to need to use all the time is doc dot at underscore CSS. What this will do is let you pass in a CSS selector, but it'll only match the first matching item and it'll give you an element back instead of an array. So if I did doc.atcssa, this will give me an actual Nokogiri element, and it's the first link on the page that matches. I could find a later one by passing nth child 3, and this will give me comments right here. So nth child 4 would probably be this link for show, and we can test that out here. And if you ever want to pull the text out of a Nokogiri element, you can just do dot text, and that's how you get the text out of it. So now that we've got the very basics covered, I am going to outline five separate web scraping scenarios of increasing difficulty, and I will show you how to conquer each one of them. Level one, static content. So I'm a really big basketball fan, and I like to hack around with NBA statistics a lot. For example, I want to get a list of every game that Steph Curry played in last season and see how many three-pointers he made and attempted in each one. Well, basketballreference.com is a great source for this kind of information. It's a database that has NBA statistics in a really nice organized format. However, it doesn't have an API. So this is the 2015-16 regular season. This is every game Steph Curry played in. And right here is the number of three-pointers he made and attempted. So let's see if we can go ahead and scrape this. So first and foremost, I'm going to copy the endpoint into a variable called endpoint. Now, if you're just doing static scraping, where you're just going to a URL and getting the HTML and parsing it, you don't actually need to use a ghost browser. In Ruby, you can just do open endpoint, and that will actually make the HTTP request, get the HTML store in memory, so that we should be able to then noco geary colon colon HTML dot parse that to get our doc. And it looks like that worked. Now, this is an HTML table, the way that this data is organized in. And there's a bunch of different HTML tables on this page. So if I did doc.css table.count, there's 12 separate HTML tables. But I can see just by looking at this page that this is the biggest one, or at least it has the most table rows. So I can probably isolate it by doing doc.css table 
dot sort x comma y y dot css tr dot count spaceship x dot css tr dot count and that will sort the tables by the number of table rows in it and i'll take the first one of that and save it as games table and it looks like that worked it looked like this games table is this table right here and now we want to get eat all the table rows from that table so i would do rows equals games table dot css tr and there should be 82 of them because there's 82 games in a season so if i did rows dot count it looks like there's 87 so we have some data that we don't actually want and that's because these headers are here so we're going to need to remove them from our data set well this is why i like using scripting languages for this kind of web scraping because it's it's really easy because you have mutable data structures to just kind of rows equal rows dot select where as row where row dot css th dot empty so this will say only pick the rows that don't have any ths and now if we did rows dot count now we have 82 so now we have each one of the games and we want to grab the three pointers made and the three pointers attempted from each one noting that some of them will be nil because he didn't play in them so let me set this equal to a variable called data equals rows dot map do as row and we'll return row dot at underscore css td nth child i happen to know this is nth child 14 dot text and i'll actually do dot try text which is a rails function that will return nil instead of erroring out if the method doesn't exist and then we'll do row dot at underscore css td nth child 15 dot try text and and it looks like that worked where we have the three pointers made and the three pointers attempted from each one only some of these are nil but we should be able to easily filter that out by doing data equals data dot reject as tuple tuple zero dot nil and now we should have our data set of three pointers made three pointers attempted in a nice clean format with no nails. And yeah, that was scraped off of this endpoint pretty seamlessly. Level two, dynamic content. Okay, so now I have a list of the Golden State Warriors roster, and I want to get an image for each player. Now, a great way to do this might be to just loop through each player, go to Google Images and get the first result and save it to a database, upload it to S3, whatever you want to do with it. But Google Images does not have an API, so this is a great example of a time when you might need to use browser automation. So let's do browser equals water colon colon browser dot new chrome. And let's make the browser go to Google Images equal dot go to images dot google dot com. And we're going to need to be able to dynamically fill in this message field and click the button. So you need to get some sort of unique identifier for an input field when you want to fill it in. So I will click around on here and I'll see, for example, that this has a title equal to search. So that's a way that we might be able to uniquely identify it. So I could do browser dot text underscore field and then some selector title colon search dot set and then some text so we'll just give it sample text for now which is Steph Curry and that will actually write data into the browser likewise we can figure out some unique identifier for a button browser we could do browser dot button and I happen to know that this is the only submit button on the page so I could do where type is submit and then dot click and that will actually click the button and then go to the next page and now we could do dot, we can parse out the HTML, get the first image, save it, and loop through it. One thing to note though, is that when I hit this button, the actual Google Images page loads with JavaScript. It doesn't actually make a separate HTTP request, it, it loads dynamically. So if you try to grab the HTML before the data is loaded, it's not gonna work. So one thing you can do is just use the Ruby sleep command 
sleep for one second so that you can wait for the JavaScript to load the data and then parse out the HTML. So let's see what this would actually look like if we wanted to automate it. We would do, let's call this warriors player images equals warriors roster dot map do as player. And then we'll do browser dot go to images dot google dot com. We will fill in that text field browser dot text underscore field title search dot set, but we'll set it with the player. And then we'll do browser dot button type submit dot click. Then we're going to sleep for one second just to let the JavaScript load. And then we'll do doc equals nokogiri colon colon html dot parse browser dot html. And then now that we'll have this document parsed, I'll just use the CSS selector that I happen to know that it is doc at CSS div ID iRes. And if you needed to figure this out from scratch, you could just use the inspector to figure out what the ID of the image is. This is just getting the first image from the page and we'll hit end and we'll see this go. So it gets Kevin Durant, it gets Steph Curry, it gets Clay Thompson, it gets Draymond Green. And you can see that it's just automating this and it's pulling out the, the source of each image. So this is one way that you could grab a lot of images from Google Images really, really quickly. And now that it's finished, we can see that this came back. We have these data images here for each player, and we could zip the arrays together, upload them to S3, etc. Level 3. JavaScript Injection. Now I want to access play-by-play -play data from a Warriors Blazers game. Well, stats.nba.com is a great place to go because not only did they have play-by-play -play information from every single game, but if I click on one of the plays, I can actually access a video clip of it. Which is pretty cool. Now, the way that these URLs to the video clips are done are based on an internal event number that isn't written anywhere on this page. So if I wanted to scrape this site and store the reference, the, not only the plays, but the references to the videos also, it doesn't seem like there's any way to do it. Fortunately, though, if you inspect the page and take a look at the source code, I can actually see that this is an AngularJS app. You can tell by this ng dash moniker on a bunch of the items. Now, back in the day, I used to do a bunch of Angular stuff, so I happen to know my way around an Angular code base. One of the things you can do, so this is just a quick Chrome DevTools tip. If you do dollar sign zero, that'll give you the actual JavaScript object of whatever you had highlighted. And I know that you can get to the Angular context by doing angular.element and then wrapping uh, a JavaScript node. And then you can access the internal data structure that's backing that node by doing .scope.row. So this actually will give me access to a JavaScript object that has more information than that's displayed on the page, including the event number, which I need to get to the video. So if I wanted to scrape this page, I could actually store the event number and the description of every play in my own database and then access the video whenever I want to look at it. Well, this is kind of on that gray area of whether or not this is allowed or not, because technically this is all public information. It's in the source code that's displayed on their public facing website, but it's also not intentionally displayed in the user interface. So when you go and scrape this kind of information, it's kind of 50 50. In this case, I think it's completely OK, but you might want to check the terms of service of a specific website before you access information that you may or may not be intended to access. So how could we write a script to inject JavaScript code and get this data out? Well, first and foremost, let's spin up our browser. Browser equals water colon colon browser dot new Chrome. And then we will go to this URL browser dot go to and we'll paste the URL in. Let me grab this guy. And when we want to inject a script, into this page, we can do browser.execute script and then pass in a JavaScript, a piece of JavaScript code. And whatever we return from that JavaScript code will be the value that is returned from that statement. So just as a quick example, we could do angular.element 
H1, just to grab the H1 and get the text of it like that. And if we return this, we can see this string is returned. But this is actually a Ruby data structure. We could set this equal to a variable, data, and now we have a Ruby string. So even though we wrote JavaScript code and injected it into the web page, because we return it, the engine that's driving this water browser knows how to convert that into a Ruby string. So all we need to do is get an array of each of these table rows and loop through it by getting access to that event number and return it, and we should be able to get an array of the data that we want. So let's go ahead and write, try to write this script. We can do script equals, and I'm gonna use a here doc here. If you've never seen a here doc before, you write great, less than, less than, dash, and then any arbitrary string of characters. And then this is just a way to write a multi-line string. So Ruby will interpret everything that I write after this as a string until it sees this line of characters again. So that's a way that I can write like JavaScript code and hit enter a bunch of times without it trying to execute anything. So first and foremost, we'll do var rows equals document dot query selector all table tr dot ng scope. And this will actually give us all the table rows in this table var data, which this will be the data that we return. We'll just keep it as an empty array for now. And then we can do a for loop for i equals zero. I is less than rows dot length. I plus plus var row data equals angular dot element rows I dot scope dot row. And then we can data dot push and we'll push an array that contains row data dot event num, which is that event number that we need to access the video. Then we could do row data dot home description and row data dot visitor description. This is just the description of the plays and the for loop. And then we need to return data from this script because the return value is what Ruby is going to get out of this. And then JavaScript to end the here doc. So we just literally just wrote a string like that. That's all that the here doc did. And then we can say browser dot execute script script. And we'll see that we actually did manage to pull out not only the event number, but also the descriptions of both the home and the away plays. And this looks like it might just be the same as the index, but it's actually not. So like 44 goes directly to 46 here. That's why you need to get the actual event number. And then we could set this to a variable data and then do our normal manipulation like data. To, if I wanted to get rid of some of those nils, data dot map as item, item dot compact, and then let's dot reject anything where item dot length is equal to one. And there we go. That's the event numbers and the play description. And we had to inject JavaScript in order to get it. Level four, iframes. So there is a really high correlation between websites with a lot of data on them that don't offer APIs and websites that have a lot of iframes on them. So chances are, if you're going to do any kind of serious web scraping, you are going to encounter iframes at some point. And they have a little bit of wonky behavior. So this is a site that I already have open in my ghost browser. And it's just a simple HTML site, but it has an iframe right here and some text inside this iframe. So we're going to try and pull this text out that says iframe example. If we look in our console and inspect it, we can see this is an H3 tag, and it's nested inside of an iframe, which has a document inside of it. So the way that I would think to go about doing this is to do exactly what we've done before, doc equals nokogiri colon colon html dot parse browser dot html, and then do doc dot css h3 to pull out the h3 tag. But when I hit enter, it comes up empty. For some reason, Nogogiri did not parse the iframe. And that's because when we're looking at the HTML of the browser, the browser is only looking at the HTML on the page. It's not looking inside the nested documents that exist in iframes and pulling out that HTML also. What we will need to do is tell our web driver to switch the context into the nested document, and then our browser will be able to access that HTML. 
So if you need to access the raw web driver, you can do browser.driver, which will give you access to the Selenium web driver object. Selenium is the library that runs the web driver that the Ruby water library is built on top of. And we can do browser.driver.switch to dot frame and pass in an argument here. Now there's two kinds of arguments you can pass in here. One is a numerical index. So every frame on the page is given a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 index. But it, also iframes have names on them. So normally when you see an iframe in a page, it'll say name equals something. And that string you can pass into here. In this case, I know that this iframe I want to get access to is the second iframe on the page. So I can switch to it like this. Now our browser is in the context of that iframe. So if I go back and I do our Nokogiri parse, and then I try to query for the h3 tag again, it looks like it actually does pull out a result. And now I could do doc at CSS h3 dot text, and that gives me my iframe example text. Final boss, deployment. Now, when we want to deploy our web scrapers to the cloud, chances are we don't want to use that Chrome web driver. First off, it takes up a lot of memory to run, and it also requires manual DevOps to configure on your machine. A better idea is to use the headless web driver PhantomJS. Phantom is just a browser the same way Firefox, Chrome, or Safari is. It has the exact same APIs. The only difference is that PhantomJS does not have a UI, so it has a lot less overhead to run. You can download it from phantomjs.org. I already have it installed, but let me show you how you could use it. We'll spin it up the exact same way we've been doing, waterbrowser.new, only instead of passing in Chrome as the browser, I will pass in phantomjs. Now notice that no applications launched. There was no new app that was opened, we, but we still have a reference to it. That's because it doesn't have a UI. Now we can tell it to go to a site the same way we've been doing, browser.goto phantomjs.org and then we can do the exact same thing doc and we can just try to pull out the text from some h1 tag that text and it gives us full web stack no browser required which is the text from right here and we did this without having a UI for a browser. So we can do exactly what we did before, but with a lot less overhead. And now when you want to deploy this, say you want to deploy it to Heroku, they actually have a Heroku build pack that comes pre-installed with PhantomJS. So quick primer on how Heroku works is that it will detect what programming language you're using, and then it will call out to the default Heroku build pack for that language. So if you're using Node.js, Ruby, Clojure, Java, whatever, it has default custom build packs that it will build your machine from. But you can also instead tell it to use a custom build pack that has certain software already installed. For example, the PhantomJS library, say I want to use the default Phantom build pack, then you'll have a server that has Phantom and you can do your web scraping on the cloud. If you are still watching this video, then I am very impressed because that was a lot of information to process. So I'm going to show you something really fucking cool as a reward. At any time when your virtual browser is running, you can call out to browser.screenshot.png and it will actually take a snapshot of the current window of the browser as pixel data that you can upload to S3 or Dropbox. I used to have like a bunch of cloud scrapers running that I would have take screenshots and text them to me so I could see like the actual URLs that they were on at various times is pretty cool. As always, I am at always be coding on Twitter. Hit me up if you have any questions, concerns, comments, videos that you want me to cover. And come on, it is 2016. Make APIs for things.